I, I think so, because um, oh. we don't have as many resolving cards. We'll discuss that. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jim Rockwell. Our program is People in Jazz, and today our man in jazz is Wes Montgomery. And many years ago, about 1959, well, it was indeed in 1959, a dear old friend with whom I had been associated and who owned a record company, which was Riverside, sent me a demonstration record of uh, an album he was about to release. And it was a guitarist then quite unknown, who was Wes Montgomery, who since then has emerged and has become a, a major star. And it delights me to have watched this happen over the years, Wes. It's been nearly 10 years. It's been nine years. But in those years, to watch this, this blossoming from an unknown guitarist from Indianapolis to the major star that you are. And I remember so fondly the things on, on Riverside West because I think in all of the years that that company existed with mm -hmm. Bill Grover's death before the company ended. But I think in all of the years that Riverside existed, they never knowingly released a bad album and that is a rare company that does this. Is. A rare company. So many companies, they'll release a thing they, they don't really believe it's that great, but it'll sell, do it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting that every album they ever made was great, but if it didn't come off bad, it isn't because they didn't try. Right. I mean, if it did come off bad, it isn't because they didn't try to make a good album. Everything they did was intended. They didn't know what they were doing. Art for art's sake and a good album. Right. And they had such great faith in Wes Montgomery, and they had such insight in being the first to record you. Right. That happened because Cannonball Adderley heard you in Indianapolis and went back and told the Riverside oh, people. Those. He said, this man in Indianapolis was playing guitar till you wouldn't believe. Now, this is the way most unknown players become known, I think, as itinerant musicians traveling around the country as you do now, when you get in a local town, you hear somebody and you go back to New York and say it. When you travel around the country, Wes, and indeed now you travel all over the world, mm -hmm. do you listen to players wherever you go? Every chance I get, um, but uh, we've been working so much, it's hard to get out to hear other groups and other fellows. I, I hear some uh, guitar players uh, now and then, uh, upcoming guitar players, and uh, sound good. Where, where have you heard somebody? Who uh, uh, does someone come to your mind now that you that you've heard uh, an unknown guitarist that's playing someplace well, unnoticed? Yeah, Joe Diaro from uh, Chicago. Uh, have you heard of him? No. <coughs> He's together. And um, <clears throat> but I think the most fantastic guitar player I've heard was Nelson Simon. Is in Montreal, Canada. Oscar Peterson uh, told me about him. Coltrane told me about him. Um, Horst Silver told me about him. Also, most of the major um, uh, musicians has told me about him. So I figured, he must be great. And I played there um, one week, and uh, I had a chance to hear him. So I couldn't burn my guitar up, because I was working. Boy, so. mm -hmm. uh, well, that was... <laughs> if you ever come here, it's over. Oh, really? <laughs> See, now, you probably don't believe this, do you? No, I... Because I, I, I sort I of... I uh, never doubted you in my life. But I, I sort of uh, felt like, you know, you know, you can feel like a guy is good, sure. You yeah. know, it could uh, excite somebody. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the way I felt, but it's much more than that. Uh, he's got a new approach to the instrument, a uh, new direction. For instance, he played cards as fast as a lot of guys play lines. Well, you do this. No, 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 no. I mean, play them. I mean, he'd, he'd make all the changes, all of them. I mean, without, uh, like, if you start off with big changes, he'd continue with large changes. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. That's never anything like that. And he's always crying. He's always talking, oh, I'm not ready. I'm, I can't get myself together. I'm talking about, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much, man. How old a man is he? I don't know. He looked like he's around 31, maybe mm -hmm. 29, 30, 31, mm -hmm. something like that. He don't know his own talent. He don't know it. Well? So keep that in mind. Nelson Simon. Nelson Simon in right. Montreal. Montreal. The last Oscar about him when he's in town next. All right. But now here's the case in point. You have mentioned half a dozen musicians <clears throat> who have told you about this guy. Right. 
and this is the way unknown players frequently become known players, right. is that other players hear them. Right. The word spreads. Now, uh, does it wait then for a player like one of these that you've mentioned, or like yourself, mm -hmm. to hit on a record company about a, an unknown player like this? See, the reason I'm mentioning this, uh, 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 Wes, is that so frequently players will come to me or come to somebody yeah. and say, I want to play. What do yeah. I do? Yeah. Well, it's, it's not uh, quite as easy today as it used to be. Uh, uh, major recording companies a while back were looking for new talent, mm -hmm. but they don't seem to be looking for it anymore, um, unless it comes from uh, uh, the people that's in the company. Mm -hmm. I mean, outside uh, uh, names doesn't mean anything. Like, for instance, if I went to, I'm with the A&M now, if I went to um, my company and said, well, look, it's a guy I think is great. I don't care what he's saying or what. They said, yeah, great, good, come on in, have some coffee, you know. They're, they're an awful subject. Uh, it's just different, that's all. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, the same differences that um, uh, a lot of major uh, jazz labels has sort of started their artists to put um, one or two commercial things on an album. Mm -hmm. they, they used to wouldn't do that. I mean, okay. Like Riverside was one of the ones. I mean, they didn't, they didn't uh, deviate uh, one way or the other, but uh, just like things change, you know. Mm -hmm. So and that's one of the things that's not changed. You said, for instance, that this young man is unaware of his talent. This is yeah. historically what has been said of Wes Montgomery. Everyone in life has said Wes had no idea how infinitely talented the man is, because you're a self-taught guitarist. Yeah. It has also been said that in the history of the instrument, there have been three men who have done something new, who have brought a new dimension to the instrument, and who have made an honest to goodness contribution to the to the to the instrument. Django Reinhardt, Charlie Christian, and Wes Montgomery, because before you, no one played the way you play. Mm -hmm. And it's been said because you didn't know, <laughs> right? Had you, been a, had you been a schooled guitarist, had you been taught <laughs> from the very get-go to do everything according to impeccable technique, yes. and everything as it should be done, you wouldn't be the player you are, I think. Probably not. Uh, probably because um, <clears throat> you, don't have, uh, you don't have any instructions saying that you can't do. Um, it's all in your own mind, what you feel like doing. Not or, what you, or what you feel like to be developed. Not having been channeled in a traditional, uh -huh. in the traditional track of a, of a schooled guitarist, you were free to go. Right. Fortunately, you went in a beautiful way. Fortunately. Now this, right, right but then this is not to say, I'm, I'm just thinking that each of these three men that we've mentioned, Django Reinhardt, yeah. Charlie Christian, and yourself, have all been self-taught guitarists. Yeah, come yeah, okay, okay. But this is not to say that uh, a young man aspiring to play should uh, intentionally remain self-taught right. and, and avoid all, all schooling right. because it's a rare man indeed who can be a self-taught player and have it come off and do something right. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, I know <clears throat> quite a few fellows that are self-taught. But I guess like anything else, uh, sometimes it comes off and sometimes it don't. And um, uh, any part of it is rare when it comes to making uh, any contribution at all. Yours is a family of self-taught musicians, and we'll hear some of them now. Great. Pianist in the, in the group is uh, Wes's brother, Buddy Montgomery. The bassist is Wes's brother, Monk Montgomery. Uh, these are all self-taught players, and we'll hear the group. Play windy for us. Okay. All Go right. Good.
The group is beautiful, yeah. as always. Yeah. Watching you play, we were able with the cameras to get some tight shots on your thumb oh. and <laughs> and the technique that has set you apart from from other guitarists. Mm -hmm. There's the story about the guitarist on the West Coast who said he spent one whole day trying to slam a car door on your thumb. You know who that was? Who was that? Jim Hall. Jim Hall. <laughs> Speaking of guitarists. <laughs> Jim Hall. Right. But this technique, which is unschooled, mm -hmm. and it's pure West Montgomery, this mm -hmm. technique, and what you do with it, playing octaves in your solo lines, this is what set, has set you apart from every other guitarist in life. And as I remember the story you telling me many years ago, this came about because, first of all, playing with your thumb rather than a pick was quieter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't, uh, like, uh, a pick seems to uh, have more of a piercing sound, and it, it's sharper. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, when I first started, I started with a pick, of course, everybody else was starting with a pick. And I used to just uh, keep my, I liked it for my amplifier to be on because I found out that when you practice without an amplifier for like two months, and then you use an amplifier, you hear more noise than you do, do, you do notes. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I'll break that habit, so I just use an amplifier all the time. But while doing that, uh, I would uh, go into the night practicing. And, um, but I forgot I was disturbing neighbors. <laughs> yeah. So that was uh, very shortly brought to my attention. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so then I thought, um, well, I have to cut down some kind of way. But I, didn't, I had my amplifier really cut down. Mm -hmm. If I cut down much more, I might as well not use it. So then I uh, set the pick on the top of the amplifier and, and made it much of a rounder sound softer. Mm -hmm. So I'll use that until I get where I can play, and then I'll use a pick. But I forgot you have to develop a pick. Then you learned that you couldn't use a pick. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because you had learned to play with your thumb. That's right. And you couldn't use a pick. That's right. So then I wasn't trying to be one of the best anyway. I was just playing for my own amusement. So if I go through all the trouble of developing a pick when I can play my thumb, I want to play. You know? Now, every schooled guitarist in the world knows that it's impossible to play without a pick and to play, that, yeah. to play as you play. Well, they claim the thumb is the slowest finger, operating finger on the hand. Yeah. I think that's why well, they, uh, my classical players use their thumb, but not in the same manner. Right. You see. But you get incredible speed. Uh, yeah, well, it hurts. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in some kind of way. Yeah. You get with incredible <laughs> speed with your thumb. <laughs> but this is what has set you apart. Yes. This and, as I say, what you do with it. The octaves in your solo lines, again, this was a thing unheard until mm -hmm. West Montgomery. How'd you hit on that? Well, I was tuning up one day, and my guitar was always out of tune. Well, I thought it was uh, because I had a bad guitar at that time. Yeah, I bought a lemon, but even the new one, they, they just don't stay in tune. So it was it was uh, laid out like it would be in tune, maybe down at the low end, but up here, within this range, it would be out of tune. So I used to take the first string and the third string and go like that and find out how close they were together and which one goes out. They're not tuned up. So while doing that, I, I, I ran a scale. Accidentally, I said, oh, it's not too bad. And so then I put them together and ran the scale again. And the only thing I could uh, figure anything to it was just two notes. And I said, oh, it's not too much. Then I was going to run again and check it out, and I missed it. I said, oh, come on. You know, you don't do it accidentally. And making them try to do it on, intentionally and miss it, you know, that's yeah. turned around the wrong way. So <laughs> I had yeah. trouble ever since then. After I got so I, I played the scale, I went through there and I start. I said, well, I think I'll play a, a melody, you know, line. Come play a melody line. And every time I, uh, when I get one thing accomplished, then I couldn't do the next step. So I said, oh, come on, you know, two notes, come on, you know. Mm -hmm. And I kept on to like I got so I said, well, I'm. So I want to play solo lines with it, which I couldn't do at that time. Mm -hmm. My hand just get cramps, and I take it off the guitar to still be like that. I said, <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, oh, it was yeah. horrible. But you did make it. Yeah, finally. You yeah. sure did make it. <laughs> Great, man. And when this was first heard, I remember the comment. I remember the people saying, good grief, listen to this. He's playing solo lines. He's playing octaves in solo lines. Mm -hmm. There was a story... 
of a young guitarist who came to this country as a uh, an exchange student going to school in this country and in Europe he was a guitar student mm -hmm. he wasn't coming here to study guitar he was mm -hmm. coming here to go to the university but back home he was a he was a, a guitar mm -hmm. student and when he left Europe to come here his guitar teacher in, in Europe said if you are ever in a town where West Montgomery is playing go and watch him notice the key word was watch huh? go and watch him and then come back and show me how he does that mm -hmm. and I've had so many guitars comment along the same line they listen for instance to your records they hear what you're doing but they can't yeah. in their mind hear the fingering that would accomplish this yeah I, I had uh, I received a lot of letters with um, uh, a piece of paper in it draw it, a guitar neck to find out what finger goes on what string mm -hmm. and and how what the process was and at the same time they, they used to study me once a month over there. All the guitar players would get together and they would wonder, each one would put his ideas of what I was doing. So when I went to Europe, we all got together, all the top guitar players, well, I guess it was about 24, all around. And uh, we used the music store basement and we got together and just discussed guitar. It was amazing. Oh, really? It was amazing. Beautiful. The, uh, the letters you used to get with a chart of the guitar, and yeah. the, these were from European players. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they, uh, like, uh, they, they got, I forget the name of the magazines that they have in Europe, something like Don Beat over here. Yes. And, uh, and they would have questionnaires of different uh, guitar players and answers. Mm -hmm. And what naturally, uh, they received, uh, we received magazines over here. And, uh, and they would, uh, each one would comment about what, what they think I was, what approach they think I was using and the difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of them felt that uh, uh, they come to the conclusion out of the whole group that, they don't take me as a guitar player. Oh? I'm not a guitar player to them. What are you? I use it. They, they consider, I like, see. what their approach to the instrument, they're guitar players. Yes. But I don't use it as, uh, I, don't, I don't play it as a guitar. You use, I use it, it as a musical instrument? Yeah, as an instrument to, to, uh, to, to project what I have in mind. So that, I thought that's, that's an interesting true. analogy, and, and perhaps holds, right. holds some water. Right. Yes. That's right, because I don't know anything about the instrument. <laughs> well, I mean, you know what I mean. I understand what you mean. I don't want to know anything about it, really, because it's too much. That's another feel. Yeah. You find a lot, of, a lot of fellas, they spend more time, so well, I, I don't think I have the right pickup. I like to pick up with the, the, so many screws in for the magnet, and some say, well, I got the wrong bridge, and, you know, it's, when you get through, you still have to play it, you know. Yeah. Right. Your, your thinking along that line of, now for instance, we're a good teacher to come along now mm -hmm. and try to touch what you are doing could destroy completely what West Montgomery is. And it reminds me so of a story of Ben Webster who went to a teacher. Now this was long after Ben Webster was an established star. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was rather late in, in, in Ben Webster's life. Mm -hmm. He went to a classical teacher to learn technique. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the teacher was an old fan of Ben Webster's. And you know, Ben has this great wide, fat, breathy yes, tone. Right. And it sounds like there's as much breath coming around the reed as through that's it, right? right, that's right. <laughs> and this, this teacher was, a, was a, a fan of Ben Webster's. But when Ben came to him to study technique, and the teacher said, play something for me, and Ben played for him. And the teacher said, Mr. Webster, you do everything wrong, uh -huh. but it's beautiful, and don't you change anything. He wouldn't touch him. He refused. He said, I will not touch what you are doing, and for heaven's sake, don't go to anybody else. Well, I think, uh, like, for instance, I got, it's a, I got a book coming out uh, the first of the year. And it's been so many uh, fellows that's interested in knowing um, uh, what approach I take. Mm -hmm. So musically, in a book form, this book might explain a lot too because uh, there'll be a lot of fellows I won't, probably won't run into, but the book will probably teach them musically the approach. There is a story of the bumblebee 
that has frequently been attached to West Montgomery. That according to the laws of aerodynamics, of wing surface to body weight, that it's aerodynamically impossible for the bumblebee to fly. But the bee, not knowing this, flies. <laughs> West Montgomery <laughs> is, uh, Flying, right? is flying. <laughs> just as unknowingly as the bumblebee. Wes, <laughs> play something for us. Okay. Uh, California, California Nights. Nights. Right. California Nights. Great.
Midwest playing as your Hello. passport to the world. God bless you. It's a pleasure. Thank doing. you for giving us this time today. Beautiful. Pleasure. You're, you're, you're beautiful and, and guard your thumb. <laughs> oh. Guard your thumb. I believe that. Our program is People in Jazz. And our man in jazz today has been Wes Montgomery, guitarist by appointment to the world. This is Jim Rockwell. Good night.